Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, Western military harvesting Russian genes. And we don't mean denim. We got that story plus perusing the Paradise Papers. But first, we continue to shine a light on the agenda known as Vision 2030 as we begin with an article from Nikkei.com. Saudi purge brings China card into play in Aramco deal. Plans to list shares of Saudi Aramco, the world's biggest oil producer, have taken a new twist in recent weeks with talks of selling shares directly to China or other institutional investors first rather than going to the stock exchange. Adding to the uncertainty is the anti-corruption crackdown being carried out by the crown prince Mohammed bin Salman in which a number of influential princes and senior officials have been implicated arrested and or, you know, killed in a helicopter crash of convenience, including an Aramco board member who has also been arrested. The Aramco IPO forms the centerpiece of Vision 2030, a blueprint for economic and social reforms meant to diversify and re-energize Saudi Arabia's oil-dependent economy. The proceeds from the sale are to be used to foster domestic industry and create jobs. The plan is to sell a combined total of around 5% of Aramco shares next year on the Saudi Stock Exchange. Prince Mohammed expressed his enthusiasm to sell Aramco shares early last year and has stated that the company should be valued at more than $2 trillion. That would entail the largest IPO in history, dwarfing the what would be the previous record of $25 billion by China's Alibaba. So, James, can you give us some 2020 vision on this 2030 agenda, as you and I, I think, have been talking about this since they first kind of announced it. And that goes back to New World Next Week in April of 2016. James. That's right. So for people who don't know, this 2030 vision agenda plan, whatever, is um, supposedly the brainchild of uh, clown prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman the king in waiting, question mark, um, who is behind this purge that's going on right now. And uh, I'm sure in reality it was written by handlers and string pullers and who have you. But anyway, he has the official stamp on this as his vision for the future of Saudi Arabia, which is essentially an attempt to rebrand Saudi Arabia for the post-carbon technocratic era. And one great sign of that was just last week, uh, or just five, six days ago now? It was not very long ago, a week or two ago. Uh, they were having this big conference in Riyadh about the uh, the future and this uh, this new city, this new mega city, this smart, interconnected, blah, 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 Internet of Things, uh, incredibly futuristic city that they're going to be building in the desert, this $500 billion city that they're uh, going to be unveiling, working on. Um, and apparently listing on on the exchanges on, in the markets, they're going to be it's going to be like Aramco. They're going to be listing it. So it's uh, this this Neom, as they're calling it, this future megacity, was launched at this conference in Riyadh, uh, at, at the same one at which they gave the citizenship to the robot that people might have heard about that crazy story. Because again, this is part of the rebrand. You know, Saudi Arabia is the country of the future, and all of this uh, that was taking place at the Ritz Carlton, which is better known today as the place where all these princes are being imprisoned or imprisoned at any rate. So they they were all there for this big conference and now they're all there again in, you know, being under lock and key. Very, very, very strange, very incredibly important events taking place in Saudi Arabia right now. And you're right, we keep coming back to Saudi Arabia as kind of the linchpin of this changeover in world relations generally. The, this transition to new world order, whatever it, it, form and shape it takes place in, I think Saudi Arabia is going to be a key linchpin of, or at least a, a harbinger of that change. Because, as people who've watched the Big Oil documentary know by by now, after the delisting of the dollar from the gold standard, the end of Bretton Woods in 1971, the dollar has been backed up essentially by oil. Uh, in the petrodollar system. Saudi Arabia has been absolutely key to that, listing oil in dollars and then uh, funneling those dollars back through the U.S. banking system in the form of treasury purchases. That has been essentially the backbone of the world monetary system for the last four or five decades. It is falling apart now, and we are going to see some sort of changeover happening, and Saudi Arabia is going to be a key part of that. That's why I think this is an interesting part of this. The Well, what will happen with Aramco? Will it be listed on Wall Street? Or will they offer it directly, a stake directly to China? Um, if they do that, that's, I think, a pretty significant shift from the U.S. umbrella into the Chinese umbrella, which I've been talking about for years. Saudi Arabia looks like they're at least testing the waters in 
uh, trying to find a new partner with China, and that might be part of this rebrand that they're trying to do right now. So incredibly important things going on right now, especially with this crazy purge and the resignation of the Lebanese P prime minister in Riyadh and all this craziness. Suffice it to say, more than I can talk about here, but I have just recorded a couple of interviews on this um, with some people in Lebanon. Uh, they're going to be going up on my Extras channel very soon, so if you don't know about the existence of my Extras channel, please subscribe to it, or please follow me at CorporateReport.com, where you can find those interviews. They may even be posted by the time you're watching this video. And I'm going to be writing about this in a lot greater detail in my subscriber newsletter this week, so please stay tuned for that. So I'm glad you mentioned you mentioned the delisting and you mentioned both how and why big oil conquered the world. Both those documentaries, very important. And I think it ties in with the public relations move of the Rockefellers sort of divesting themselves of fossil fuels. And it ties in, I think, with this with this larger move we see on the different parts of the grand chessboard. So we'll include links to not only that story, but of course, the other story, Saudi Prince, seven others dead after helicopter crash. And the flashback links to our previous discussions of Saudi Vision 2030. Our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 327 for November 9th, 2017. We head off to Russia for a little more examples, James, of Russian collusion, but not the way they want you to think about it. Russian biological samples collected for research by U.S. Air Force. This, of course, from Russia today. The choice of the Russian population for genetic material was not intentional and is related to research on the musculoskeletal system, so said the U.S. Air Education and Training Command spokesman. Eyebrows were first raised in July when the Air Force issued a tender seeking to acquire samples of RNA from Russians. It announced that all samples shall be collected from Russia and must be Caucasian. According to the AETC spokesman Captain Bo Downey, the 59th Medical Group's Molecular Research Center is currently conducting locomotor studies to identify various biomarkers associated with trauma. Downey told Ria Novosti that the study required two sets of samples with disease and control samples of RNA and synovial membrane. The first set was provided by a what is just referred to as a U.S.-based company. This is not the first attempt to collect samples of Russian genetic material by foreign agencies in Russia, so says Igor Nikulin, former member of the United Nations Biological Weapons Commission. He told RT, quote, such attempts were made back in the 90s when there was the Human Genome Pro Program. Then there were various programs in the 2000s, too, under different pretexts. But for some reason, all this happens in the interest of the U.S. military department, and this raises suspicion. James, you shared this on your Twitter account, so I'm thinking this might raise a little bit of suspicion with you as well. We're looking essentially at biological warfare, and the little clues and hints are hidden within the language right there in, in the open. That's exactly right. And the idea of biological weapons being developed on genetic um, DNA testing or those lines being used to create bio, uh, race-specific bioweapons is not fantasy. It's not science fiction. It's already been tried and developed to some extent. We don't have all the details, but it was uh, being researched in, I believe, in South Africa. But uh, the, the Israelis were quite interested in it, obviously. Um, so this has been around for decades, this idea of race-specific bioweapons. And let's not forget, part of the Rebuilding America's Defenses documents, uh, PNAC issued a, one year before 9-11, said, you know, we have to make the idea of race-specific bioweapons viable. I mean, craziness that we, one can hardly imagine how that could be even put in a document like that. But there it is. So um, it is a very important subject, and that's why... Uh, it, sh it is no laughing matter that, oh yeah, we're just collecting Russian, you know, RNA, don't worry about it, you know, just just rest your little heads and don't, don't think about it too much. And that's why, obviously, Putin did bring it up um, recently um, when he was uh, giving, a, I believe, a, a press conference and he said, uh, the images being collected, that's okay. But do you know that biological material is being collected across the whole qu country? Here's the question, why are they doing this? I mean, yeah, very good question. And I think we are moving into the era where we already should be, but at the, any rate, going forward, we should be very concerned about 
our genetic material and how it's being collected and by whom and how it's being used and stored and databased and all of that. And as I was just talking about on questions for Corbett just a week or two ago, um, someone asked about this, so, you know, will they create a genetic database? It already exists. If you have been born in a Western hospital in the last four, I think four decades, five decades now, uh, when they prick your heel and get your blood spots on those cards, they have your genetic material, and they say that the, the U.S., uh, the Pentagon, is allowed to use that for genetic testing and, and research. So they already own your genetic material. Um, the question is, well, what are they going to do with it? And unfortunately, there aren't very good answers to that question. And that's why it boggles my mind that people are willingly sending their genetic material to 23andMe and places like this. Oh, tell me about my genetic history, please, Mr. Uh, Corporation. Um, run by the ex-wife of uh, the Google uh, founder. I mean, it's just craziness that people would be that carefree about their genetic material, but there it is. So we should keep these stories in mind. Extremely important going forward. And I, even just last week, we were talking about how sort of the, the medical database is going to be connected to the coming mental health databases. That becomes a more kind of hot button issue. James, this is sidebar, but you brought it up. You're talking about 23andMe and Ancestry and those kind of places. I heard a lot of chatter about that when I was actually back east visiting family and friends. What would you say to the idea of someone who sent that in but didn't put their name on it and used a false name? Well, I'm all about uh, giving people false data and stuff, but uh, I don't know, you know, how they're going to use that or how that can be used. And I still wouldn't do that myself, but uh, it's maybe one of the ways to get around some of the linking of your personal data anyway. That, that That's that's what I thought when I heard that. I was like, oh, that might be kind of a, a simple idea. And, of course, people are finding out surprising things because, of course, you're always told, oh, you're this and you're Italian. And you're like, what? Oh, only a tiny percent. It's, I think people are finding out interesting things about stories they've always been told, as we're always trying to find out interesting things about the stories we've always been told. And our third and final story this week on New World Next Week is another week, another leak. But is there anything new to shine some sunlight on in the so-called Paradise Papers? Paradise Papers leak shows tax secrets of the super rich. This article tweeted by our good buddy Brock West and originally from the Sydney Morning Herald, a huge leak of 13.4 million documents from an offshore law firm and a trust company in Singapore is drawing comparisons to last year's Panama paper scandal. These documents dubbed the Paradise Papers were obtained by the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung and shared with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ. On the ICIJ website, they say the key findings reveal offshore interests and activities of more than 120 politicians and world leaders, including Queen Elizabeth II and 13 advisors, major donors, and members of America's next top president, U.S. President Donald J. Trump. It exposes the tax engineering of more than 100 multinational corporations, including, of course, Apple, Nike, and Botox maker Allergan. Reveals tax haven shopping sprees by multinational companies in Africa and Asia that use shell companies in Meridius and Singapore to reduce taxes. Shines a light on secretive deals and hidden companies connected to Glencore, the world's largest commodity trader. And provides detailed accounts of the company's negotiations in the Democratic Republic of Congo for valuable mineral resources. It also provides details on how owners of jets and yachts, including royalty and sports stars, used Isle of Man tax avoidance structures. Now, James, it's worth noting, and we'll include it in the show notes, the articles, how places like the BBC focus on the celebrities and sports stars in the paper, like the not at all surprising revelations that Bono and Madonna and the like are all in there. The Sydney Morning Herald article, of course, gets into Australian connections like the aforementioned Glencore. But there is actually one name in there I am interested in, and that's the late NXS frontman Michael Hutchins and what happened to all of his money. And that was something I actually asked Alex Constantine, the author of The Covert War Against Rock. I asked him that almost a decade ago. So that's in there. So my own pop of culture interest aside, James, do the Paradise Papers count as some good news this week? Uh, certainly not unmitigated. We'll definitely not put it in the unmitigated good news category. Um, it is, uh, well, l let's cast our mind back to New World Next Year 2017 that we did at the end of 2016, where I look back at 2016 as the, one of the top stories, uh, at the Panama Papers. And of course, at the time we were discussing, and as I talked about in my, my uh, video on the Panama Papers when it came out, 
that essentially, I mean, of course, this is about, oh, look at this person, look at that person hiding here and there. What are we going to do about it? Well, we've got to create this global tax grid. And I talked about the fact that that was already being slotted into place by October, November last year. They were signing agreements, the OECD and others are starting to put these agreements together that are essentially going to catch everybody, not just the big major mega corporations, but you and me and everybody else um, in this global tax grid that is being constructed right now. And, uh, you know, they're going to pull the switch or flip the switch one day, however many years hence, and people are going to go, oh, hey, it's an interconnected tax structure all around the world. How did that happen? Well, it's happening right now. And it's happening to a certain extent through releases of information like this. So uh, I would say that partially released information or truths that are true to a certain extent in a certain context are in some ways even more dangerous than total lies because total lies can be easily explo- exposed but when you have a a truth but it's yeah but what about all the context about around this truth that's that can sometimes be the excluded part of this so now just like the Panama Papers, we're having things like uh, the, I think the Deutsche Zeitung or whatever did this open letter to Tim Cook. You know, dear Tim Cook, why are you hiding money from the tax authorities? Don't you care about people? I mean, yes, it's legal and you're allowed to do this, but you shouldn't. And all of this, you know, hand waving, which, of course, is all it all goes back to the you have to pay your taxes and be to be a good citizen, you know, and all of that. So it's all back under the status framework. And that's ultimately where this is going to lead. And I think also in the in the realm of half truths or partially revealed truths, I think this is th- there are certain political agendas that are being played out in this release as well. So you'll see that certain people on certain sides of certain spectrums are being targeted. And one example of that is, for example, the uh, Guardian talking about offshore cash helped fund Steve Bannon's attacks on Hillary Clinton. That in fact to go back to uh, Richard Mercer who people will remember from my episode on Psychographics 101 as the person behind this uh, shadowy psychographics, we collect all your data and construct a psychographic profile of your company that uh, supposedly helped Trump and Brexit, question mark. At any rate, um, it leads back to people like that. So, look, I'm all about the people at the top of these power pyramids warring with each other and taking each other down and, you know, exposing all of this stuff. I mean, it's like WikiLeaks exposing stuff on Hillary and whatever. Great. And uh, Paradise Papers exposing stuff on Mercer and people like that. Great. You know, take I hope they all get taken down. Um, but we have to understand that there are certain political objectives that are being played out through releases like this. So I'm not saying don't look at the information, but I'm saying realize that this information is just a, a partially obscured truth that's kind of couched in this network of other agendas that are being played out behind it. Well, we'll continue to try to unobscure the partially obscured truths here. And I would suggest that people maybe take some of their earnings and hide them away in the alternative media. We are independent, non-commercial alternative media, each over a decade of work behind our own respective media empires, and we can only keep doing it with your support. And you can find the ways to support us on both the support links on our pages. James? And let me correct myself. As I'm speaking, I believe I said Richard Mercer. Of course, it's Robert Mercer. Anyway, I'm not infallible, but I try my best, and we'll keep trying our best here on New World next week. James, I'm looking forward to doing it again next week. All right. Thanks, buddy. Take care.